Hello everyone, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Today uh, we're going to be talking about tuberculosis. Is this a disease of the past or is it continuing to be a public health concern? My name is Lauren Heinecke. I'm an assistant professor of pharmacotherapy at the University of Maryland. Um, and I practice in internal medicine, but I, I really enjoy infectious diseases. So I'm really excited to talk a little bit more with you uh, today about tuberculosis. So our objectives for the presentation today are that you should be able to identify risk factors for um, people who are at risk for contracting tuberculosis. I think the first thing to know when it comes to tuberculosis is who should we be thinking about in terms of this diagnosis and who is at greater risk for developing the disease. I also think a, a very important part of tuberculosis is understanding, being able to compare and contrast the differences between someone who has active tuberculosis and latent tuberculosis and how the treatment strategies differ for these patients. I also hope that by the end you'd be able to develop a treatment plan for a patient with active or latent tuberculosis. And finally, as the last part of our presentation, we're going to talk about specifically drug-resistant tuberculosis, which is not terribly common in the United States, but uh, you know, I think one of the, the most exciting things about tuberculosis is we actually just had a new medication that was approved to treat multi-drug resistant TB. So not a drug that a lot of people are going to see, but I think uh, an important piece of information um, for people to have in their arsenal and, and to understand if they see this medication, uh, the indication would only be for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So to start out our discussion, I, I do think that talking about the epidemiology and understanding where tuberculosis is most prevalent is, is certainly very important for, for people to understand. Um, so just taking a quick look at this map, basically just to tell you quickly about the key, which is located in the lower right-hand corner. This uh, key basically estimates the new TB cases of all forms per 100,000 per population. So the lightest blue shaded regions are those that there's 0 to 24 cases per 100,000 population. So these are the areas that are, it's, it's going to be less concerning the risk of tuberculosis. So the the areas with the greatest risk or concern are those in the darkest blue color. So you'll notice parts of Africa and Asia that are highlighted in that darker blue color. And these countries have a risk that's greater than, uh, or a number of patients with new TB, uh, the risk estimates are greater than or equal to 300 cases per 100,000 population. So I think it is just important to talk about globally, how many people are we talking about being infected with tuberculosis? And globally, the estimate is that 2 billion people are infected by mycobacterium tuberculosis. So in 2011, it was estimated that there were 9 million new cases of TB and 1.4 million deaths from tuberculosis. So it does affect a, a significant proportion of people. Granted, it, it is more of a global illness. Certainly, we do still have epidemic or, um, you know, incidents in the United States, but it's not quite the same level as it is in other areas of the country. So we've talked about really the risk is highest in Asia as well as Africa. And I do think this is a, an interesting statistic. So India and China together account for 40% of the world's TB cases and Africa accounts for about one-fourth or 25 percent of the world's TB cases. So, um, you know, if we take into account those three locations together, essentially we have almost three-quarters of the world's TB um, accounted for. Just to quickly touch on multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, it's present in about 4% of new cases and in 20% of previously treated cases. So multi-drug resistant tuberculosis is not as big of a problem, but it certainly is much more difficult to treat. So it, it is concerning when someone has multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. We've had very few medications for tuberculosis come out. Um, actually, as, as I mentioned in the objectives, uh, we just had a brand new one come out and it's the first one in, in a very long time. So just to, to put things a little bit into perspective, and we're going to talk a little bit about new cases in the United States on the next slide, but in the United States, I think the statistic that is most staggering is that there are 13 million people in the U.S. that are latently infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. So a pretty good number of people have at least been exposed to tuberculosis, don't have active disease, but have been exposed and so could develop disease if the conditions are right. And we'll specifically compare and contrast 
active and latent tuberculosis in a few slides. So to take a closer look at the reported number of cases in the United States, I did just want to present um, this latest surveillance data from the CDC. So just to orient you to the graphic, the year is on the x-axis with the number of cases on your y-axis. Um, and so what you'll see is that the most recent data from 2011 shows that there are about, a hundred, or, uh, I'm sorry, about 10,000 um, reported cases of TB in the United States in 2011. So that's a rate of about 3.4 cases per 100,000 persons. And you'll see that our, our rate has been slowly coming down um, from 1982 when, when it was about 25,000 cases of tuberculosis. Um, and it, we've actually seen from 2010 to 2011 a, a pretty nice decrease. There's been about a 6% um, decrease as compared to 2010 in terms of the number of cases of tuberculosis. So it is definitely a disease that we don't see as much in the United States. Um, and this is where I think uh, particularly understanding what the risk factors are for tuberculosis is important so that we have sort of in our heads the people that were really concerned about tuberculosis as a, a potential diagnosis. This is just a quick slide about the organism itself. So it is Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and I, I've already referred to it as, as a number of things throughout the presentation. So you'll hear it called TB, you'll hear it called M tuberculosis. Um, a few just characteristics about, about Mycobacterium tuberculosis, it, it is an aerobic bacilli. It's acid fast, and so that indicates the type of, of staining that's needed to be able to see the organisms themselves. And it is very slow growing, so to be able to culture it takes a, a long time. And, and so as you can imagine, doing resistance testing uh, is a, a significant time-intensive process, which is you know typically why we use sort of the, the acid fast staining um, in terms of identifying the mycobacterium tuberculosis. We are focusing on pulmonary tuberculosis, but certainly mycobacterium tuberculosis can affect other organs in the body. Um, but we're specifically fo focusing on, on pulmonary tuberculosis today. It is probably the most common presentation for mycobacterium tuberculosis is within the lungs or pulmonary tuberculosis. Just in terms of the pathogenesis, it is contracted from inhaling infected droplets, and the droplets can be expelled into the air by either the cough or a sneeze, even just talking to a person uh, of an infected person. Um, and so I think one of the most important things from a public health perspective is the types of precautions that we take in terms of preventing the spread of tuberculosis. And so we, we do have people on droplet precautions when we're concerned about that they might have tuberculosis, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. Just for, for those of you who are not familiar with what droplet precautions are, so people are placed in negative pressure rooms and, and healthcare professionals should be wearing N95 masks. Um, I will just put in a plug that if you've not been fitted for an N95 mask, it's very important to be fitted for one. Um, they will do a test just to see how many particles are able to get into that mask. And there are two different types, at least those are the two that, that our institution uses and, and tests for. They do come in multiple different sizes. So likely if you get fit tested, they will try uh, the different sizes to see the, um, the number of particles that are able to get into the mask and make sure that is an, at an acceptable range. Um, so if you've not been fitted and you potentially come in contact with people who have tuberculosis, um, I would highly encourage you to get fit tested. In terms of the progression of illness, so you have uh, the primary infection with, which occurs, and then people, about 10% of people, go on to develop clinical disease. This is active disease where they have an infection in, in their lungs and would be considered infectious. The majority of people that uh, first come, come in contact with tuberculosis and have some sort of primary infection go on to develop latent disease. This is not active disease. And then certainly people who have clinical or latent disease um, can go on to develop a reactivation disease. And this is particularly important, um, something that uh, I think is becoming increasingly more common to be concerned about, 
their uh, prior history of, of tuberculosis um, because of our lot, a lot of our TNF alpha inhibitors and other rheumatologic, uh, immunologic agents, uh, which, which would really put people at a, a pretty big risk for reactivation disease. So I think there's a lot more talk about does somebody have a history of latent disease uh, in in more recent years because of the increased number of biologic agents that we now have available to treat a variety of conditions. We've already touched on a little bit about what the differences are between latent and active disease, but I, I do want to just spell it out. I think it's something that gets confusing and is a, and a, really an important piece to determining you know, what the appropriate therapy is for somebody. You really need to know, do they have latent disease? Do they have active disease? And so latent disease indicates that somebody has been exposed. Typically the way that we would find out someone has latent disease is they would have a positive PPD. They would then go for a chest x-ray and the chest x-ray would show no active signs of disease. So they have the bacteria present, but they don't have any symptoms of tuberculosis, so no coughing, no fevers, no night sweats, none of those constitutional bee-like symptoms that typically are present with tuberculosis, and they are not infectious. I think that's probably the, the biggest thing to remember. On, on the flip side, active disease, you also have bacteria present, but you have those signs and symptoms that I've mentioned, the coughing. Uh, we often think of hemoptysis or blood in the sputum. Um, as well as the B symptoms that I, I discussed as I was talking about latent disease. And these people are the folks that are infectious. The regimens for treating these look very different, and uh, just keep that in mind as we um, get into the treatment section in just a few slides. Okay, so the, now that we've gone over the difference between latent and active disease, I want to jump into a little bit of information about um, TB specifically in the United States and some risk factors that are associated with the development of tuberculosis. So this first slide is, again, some surveillance data from the CDC. I think, you know, it's important to understand where we see the majority of cases in the United States. Even though the rates of TB in the U.S. are low, there are some states that we do see a greater number of cases in, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with where people are immigrating to as well as, you know, potentially with uh, what borders those particular states or the, you know, the, the areas that border those states. So the areas that are shaded in blue on this map are the locations that have a greater than 3.4 um, cases per 100,000 population. And so the states with the higher uh, rates or incidences are going to be New York, New Jersey, Maryland, as well as Washington, D.C. Um, we also include Florida, Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, and then uh, Alaska, California, Nevada, and New Mexico. So I think it's important to understand which states have a, a greater uh, incidence or prevalence of tuberculosis. I also think it's important to break it down a little bit by ethnicity. Again, this is not really to, to single people out, but more to think about who's at greatest risk and who are the people that we really need to be thinking about tuberculosis in. So this graphic, um, just to orient you to it, has the cases per 100,000 on the y-axis and the year on the x-axis. And then the different ethnicities are color-coded, and that color coding is down below the graphic. So the brown color coding is um, ethnicity is Asian. You'll notice that Asians do have the highest rate of tuberculosis in the United States. And again, we've talked about that 40% of the tuberculosis cases in the world are accounted for by the disease that we see in India as well as China. So the, the statistic that, you know, Asians have a higher rate in the United States probably has to do with, some, it, it's probably folks who have immigrated from potentially those locations and maybe had an exposure while they were living there or they're going back to visit family and, and they just have a, a greater risk because uh, of visiting those particular location. The next highest group in terms of risk are Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. After that are Black or African Americans, followed by Hispanic or Latino um, people. After that, it's American Indian or Alaskan Natives, and then with the lowest risk are our white or Caucasian patients. So again, this is really just to help us put together who's at the greatest risk for this disease and who do we really need to be thinking about for it.
this again just kind of puts into perspective the um, the risk associated with being born in an area where the prevalence is significantly higher than the United States. So these are the TB cases by birth location comparing U.S. born to foreign born citizens. And so again, to orient you to the graphic, the number of cases is listed on your y-axis with the year on your x-axis. And you'll notice that there are two different color barcodes. The ones in blue are the number of cases in U.S. born patients and the light green or uh, maybe aquamarine, turquoise are the, the people who are foreign born. So if you take a look at the most recent data in 2011, you'll notice that the majority of cases um, are really in foreign born citizens. So I think that's, again, important to know, important as a part of our history taking and just important to think of when we're trying to determine if somebody has, has risk factors for tuberculosis. So just some other risk factors that go along with tuberculosis are folks who are homeless are at an increased risk, and that's um, simply because of their living conditions. They're, in, um, they're living in more congested areas. Um, people who abuse drugs and alcohol are at a higher risk for tuberculosis, as well as prisoners. And then I have human, human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV infection, highlighted in yellow, because this is probably the most important risk factor. And the reason for this is that I talked a little bit about the pathogenesis, but, but didn't get into a lot of exactly how tuberculosis is controlled by the body. And the body maintains a TB infection in check using CD4 cells or T cells. And because we know that the CD4 T cells are affected significantly in HIV, folks can't mount an immune response really to keep um, some of that TB, TB at bay or in check. So HIV is really the most uh, important risk factor for the development of tuberculosis. When someone has tuberculosis, they present with some very constitutional type symptoms as I've already discussed on a previous slide, but the ones that you'll hear most commonly are weight loss as well as anorexia. People will feel fatigued and complain about a protective cough that may be hemoptysis or, or tinged with blood, um, but it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be. And even if somebody is complain about Complaining about blood tinged sputum or hemoptysis, that doesn't always mean TB, although I think that's what many people in inherently want to think of. Um, actually, one of the most common causes of hemoptysis is bronchitis, which is very common uh, and certainly not tuberculosis. A couple of other constitutional symptoms that can be associated include fever as well as drenching night sweats. Uh, on a physical examination, what you might hear a physician talk about is they might have some dullness to chest percussion as well as rails. In order to make a diagnosis, really it involves looking at a chest x-ray. We frequently will get sputum samples and usually um, we'll get three sputum samples in which they'll do AFB smears. Uh, and you may have heard people talk about inducing sputum if someone's not coughing up a lot of sputum and you can do that using normal saline. We also use PPD tests to help us um, to, to diagnose people with tuberculosis. We also have a few other tests that are a bit newer um, that are, are really blood tests to take a look for tuberculosis. So there's an interferon gamma release assay, or IGRA, that measures the release of um, INF gamma in the blood in response to tuberculosis antigen. Um, the other test that we have is the quantiferon TB gold test, and this is an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA test, that was approved in 2005. Um, so we have some other tests that we can use to look for TB. Um, the last one is called the TB spot test. Um, it's an enzyme-linked immunospot assay, um, or ELISA spot test, that was approved in 2008. And so they both can be used to diagnose latent TB infection, and tuberculosis disease caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. So those are a, a few additional blood tests that we have available to help us in our arsenal in terms of looking for tuberculosis. Um, certainly, if somebody has active disease, we would want uh, it to be able to culture that sample, again, because we'd really want to be able to do susceptibility testing.
I did want to spend just a little bit of time talking just briefly about the PPD in interpretation because it does matter uh, if somebody has risk factors how we would interpret it. So on the left hand side of this table I have the induration that indicates a positive TB test based on somebody's risk group. So somebody who's HIV positive, recently had contact with somebody infected with TB, has a positive chest x-ray, or is an immunocompromised, their induration of five millimeters would indicate that they're positive. So if it's less than five millimeters, they're negative. Five millimeters or greater, this group gets a positive interpretation. 10 millimeters or greater is set for those who are recent immigrants, those who use intravenous drugs, residents and employees of prisons, homeless shelters and nursing homes, and folks who are under the age of four, and then uh, an induration of 15 millimeters indicating a positive TB test is someone who doesn't have any of those risk factors that I listed above. So it, the, the risk factors really do come into play when we're thinking even about how to interpret a PPD test, which is why you know, I think if you take nothing else away from this, understanding who's at the greatest risk and, and having a general sense as to who you want to think about TB for is, is a, a very important um, part of this discussion. Our goals in terms of treating these folks are certainly to cure them of the infection. We also want to prevent the emergence of drug-resistant tuberculosis, again, because the regimens become significantly more intensive. They're much more difficult to follow, involving a lot of medications. Um, and again, we, we really have very few medications that have recently come on the market, except for the one we'll talk about in just a little bit. And uh, certainly the other piece of this is it is a public health concern, so we want to prevent the, the spread of tuberculosis to other people. Now that we have our goals of treatment, let's move on to talking about what medications we have available to us to use as anti-tuberculosis medications. So the chart that I have set up here for you um, shows you the, the medications by first-line agents and then second-line agents. And the one that ha ones that have a little asterisk after them are not currently FDA approved for, to treat tuberculosis, but that doesn't you know, necessarily mean we, we don't use them, we do use them, just sort of to, to point out those designations. So I think probably the ones that everyone is most familiar with are probably isoniazid and rifampin. Um, rifapentin and rifabutin are also medications that can be used in place of rifampin. Specifically, the times that I think about using these really have to do with um, drug interactions. I'd say they're more commonly used in the HIV populations where there's more interactions between uh, rifampin and uh, generally the protease inhibitors. Then ethambutol and pyrazidone might also probably look relatively familiar. Um, and we'll talk about our, our four drug regimen. Um, essentially, the, the ones that you'll see used as first line are, are our first line agents. And then our second line agents are listed on the right hand column. And these are the medications that you're going to start to see being used in people who have multi drug resistant tuberculosis. So, one thing I do want to just point out on here. Um, are the presence of the fluoroquinolones on this list. And so one of the things that, that I've sort of pulled out of this in, in terms of thinking about patients with tuberculosis is if we have somebody who comes in with hemoptysis, the team is at all considering tuberculosis, but of course, you know, they might consider something a, a bit more common. First, if, if the patient looks like they've got infiltrates on the chest x-ray and think they've got community-acquired pneumonia, but they're ruling out tuberculosis, I generally steer them away from using a fluoroquinolone. The reason is if we use a fluoroquinolone and they had tuberculosis, we could be inducing uh, resistance by using a fluoroquinolone. So just sort of a, a little clinical pearl if you've got a patient who comes in and you're um, considering community-acquired pneumonia, but tuberculosis is in the differential, maybe based on the risk factors that we've talked about, um, perhaps using uh, third-generation cephalosporin with uh, and azithromycin or a macrolide would be a, a better option in, in those patients. So we talked about the difference between latent and active infection, and so the treatment strategies for latent and active infection are very different. For latent infection, we use monotherapy. The medication of choice is isoniazid. It can be dosed 300 milligrams a day or 900 milligrams twice weekly. We do have alternative regimens that include a weight-based rifampin um, with a max dose of 600 milligrams. That's for a total of four months. Or we can do a combination of isoniazid and rifampin 
for three months um, in patients, and the dosing is going to be the same as you see lift, listed above. Um, I would say the most common thing that you'll see is just the, the monotherapy with isoniazid, and the duration of therapy is usually nine months. Certainly when we use rifampin and isoniazid in combination, we have increased risk for drug interactions, and we also have increased risk for hepatotoxicity as well as other adverse events as a result of using the two medications together. So I think in general what you'd, you'd see done in terms of treating latent disease is just that isoniazid monotherapy. So treating latent infection is pretty straightforward, I think pretty simple. I think when you get into talking about treating active infection, it gets a little bit more complex. And I will just point out the citation that I have at the bottom, the bottom left-hand side of the slide, uh, are the guidelines that are available from the Infectious Disease Society of America. So what I, the information that I have included is, is a bit simplified, mostly because there are lots of different dosages and number of times per week that you can take these medications. Certainly, um, direct ob th observed therapy or DOT has been a significant uh, advent in the treatment of tuberculosis because we do know that adherence with the medication is so important. So I didn't go into a lot of the dosing and the number of times per week um, for the medications because there's lots of different strategies and uh, essentially it would be me just rattling off information from a chart at you. So what I will just refer you to is if you go to idsociety.org and you click on the link at the very top that's, um, I believe it's under uh, guidelines. So you click on the guidelines link and then if you go by organisms, you can look specifically at tuberculosis. So they haven't been updated since 2003. There is one new medication we're going to be talking about, but essentially for straightforward active infection that's not multi-drug resistant, the, the guidelines remain um, really unchanged. Okay, so uh, essentially what I have for you in this chart is the initial phase regimen, the medications that are included. Uh, after that, we have the duration of the initial phase. After someone completes their initial phase, they will go into a continuation phase regimen, and we have the duration for that continuation phase regimen. So the preferred regimen for patients is isoniazid with rifampin, pyrazidamide, and ethambutol. There is an alternative regimen which excludes the pyrazidamide, but most commonly you're going to be seeing the four-drug regimen. Regardless of which regimen is used, the initial duration um, or initial duration phase is, is for two months. After that, everyone would go on to isoniazid and rifampin in terms of their continuation phase. And then the duration, if they've been on the four-drug regimen, uh, the continuation phase is only going to be between four and seven months. If they were only on the three-drug regimen initially, their continuation phase is going to be seven months, or a total of nine months for everyone who only uses the three-drug regimen. So there is that, that benefit of pyrazinamide potentially decreasing the length of, of therapy to only being six months as opposed to nine months. We'll talk about how we differentiate between doing a four or a seven month continuation phase. So the, the big things that we look at in terms of determining continuation phase length is whether or not cavitary pulmonary TB is present. So cavitary pulmonary TB indicates um, more significant disease, more difficult to, to treat disease, and so the continuation phase is going to be longer if you've got somebody who's got more severe disease. We've already t discussed about the initial regimen. Uh, if it does not include pyrazidamide, the continuation phase must be seven months in length. Then the other um, reason to, to do a seven-month continuation phase is someone's receiving treatment with once-weekly isoniazid, and rifapentin, and they have a positive sputum culture at completion of the initial phase, they're going to, to go uh, on for seven months. Um, and this decision can also be based on their immune status as well. So there are other things that, that may play into to lengthening to seven months, but these are some of the general things that they discuss in the guidelines in terms of determining duration between seven and four months. So really severity of infection and what their initial regimen um, contained. I think the other important thing to talk about when we're talking about these medications to treat tuberculosis is the monitoring parameters. So these medications are 
um, have have a lot of potential toxicities associated with them. And so at baseline, we want to get HIV status on, on every patient who's going to be treated for tuberculosis. And the reason for this, as we've already discussed, is that people with HIV have more difficulty controlling their tuberculosis because their CD4 cells are affected by the HIV. And those CD4 T cells are important in terms of the, the body being able to fight off the tuberculosis infection. So it would be important to know if somebody has HIV and potentially start them on therapy for their HIV as well as the tuberculosis um, uh, simultaneously, or I think there's even some data to say that the HIV should be uh, treated first because you can have um, the iris syndrome. The medications that we use to treat tuberculosis are not benign therapies, and so knowing the monitoring parameters uh, is an important part of any discussion about tuberculosis. So there are lots of, of values that we'd want to see at baseline. Specifically, we want to check anyone who we're treating for active tuberculosis for HIV infection, um, because remember that HIV is the most important risk factor for developing tuberculosis, and again, that goes back to the immune status and the CD4 T cell. Hepatitis B and C serologies are also an important uh, laboratory value that we'd want to check. Again, the reason for this is that um, folks who use intravenous drugs are going to be at higher risk for contracting hepatitis B and C and would also be at risk for um, tuberculosis. Serum aminotransferases, bilirubin, and alkaline phosphatase are all important parameters that we would check because of the risk for hepatotoxicity associated with our, our med medications used to treat tuberculosis. So we'd want to know what the baseline values are to be able to determine if someone's having liver toxicity later on in their treatment. Serum creatinine is something that should be checked, and this is really related to dosing of ethambutol and pyrazidamide, which need to be dose-reduced if you have somebody who's got a serum creatinine or a creatinine clearance less than 30 mils per minute. Platelet count, as our medications can induce thrombocytopenia, and visual acuity as well as red-green discrimination um, is another important baseline um, evaluation to do. So during treatment, we are also going to follow sputum cultures, visual acuity uh, questioning, chest x-rays, as well as LFTs, renal function, and platelets. And the frequency is listed there for you on the right-hand side. So predominantly, we're going to be doing most of these tests monthly. Specifically, the visual acuity uh, questioning is only going to be for patients who are on ethambutol. So if they're not on ethambutol, then this would, would no longer be a parameter that we, we would need to monitor. I did want to just include a chart that shows you the agent-related toxicity so that you have a better understanding of, you know, exactly what toxicities we see with which agent. So the things that I want to, to point out is that there's hepatotoxicity really with everything except for ethambutol. So it is an, an important consideration, um, and, and those LFTs are, are important to um, take a look at at baseline. Rifampin and rifibutin both can cause orange discoloration of the body fluids, including um, if somebody wears contact lenses. So I think this is a very important counseling point for anybody who is initiated on rifampin or, or rifibutin, um, because certainly if, if I took out my contacts and they were orange, I'd, I'd be quite concerned if no one had warned me about that. Um, and I think just the other important thing to remember is with ethambutol, we can have that retrobulbar neuritis, which is why the, the um, specific ocular examinations are, are a very important part of the, the monitoring parameters. Just the last piece of talking about these medications for active treatment of tuberculosis is really that there are some significant drug interactions associated with using both isoniazid as well as rifampin. So I have this chart up here for you that has the isoniazid and rifampin listed. In the middle of that table, there's the mechanism for the interaction, so specifically which CYP isoenzymes are important to consider. Then I have listed some commonly interacting medications for you. Certainly, these are not all inclusive, but I think they're a good list to, to get started with. So isoniazid um, goes through CYP2C9 as well as 2C19 and um, 2E1. So predominantly, we have a lot of our antiepileptics up here. We also have warfarin and some of our antidepressants. It's just uh, some things to sort of think about if you have someone who um, receives a prescription for isoniazid. Rifampin, 
is an inducer of CYP3A4, 2C9, 2B6, and 2C19. So I think the bigger things with rifampin are our protease inhibitors. And as I've mentioned, um, with our patients who have HIV, if they're on uh, an antiretroviral regimen and need to get started on treatment for tuberculosis, we may select an alternative like rifabutin or rifapentin depending on um, you know, what protease and what, what their antiretroviral regimen is and, and the drug interactions. Our NR, NNRTIs also interact with rifampin. Our azole antifungals as well as methadone, warfarin, our immunosuppressants is cyclosporin and tecrolimus. So consideration if you've got somebody who's a transplant patient um, and ca contracts tuberculosis. Phenytoin as well as oral contraceptives are also included in the list of medications that can interact um, with rifampin. So that is our discussion of the treatment of active tuberculosis. I do just want to spend the last little bit of our time together talking about the treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. And I've already mentioned really wor worldwide, there's only about 4% of cases that are new cases that are multidrug resistant tuberculosis, and about 20% of previously treated tuberculosis comes back as resistant. So we're not talking about huge numbers, but we are talking about disease that is very difficult to treat. This slide that I have here for you is specifically the rates of multidrug resistant tuberculosis in the United States uh, over the time period between 1993 and 2011. Um, and so what you have, just to orient you to the, the graphic, is the number of cases is listed on your y-axis on the left-hand side with the percentage of cases uh, on your uh, right-hand axis on the, the y-axis. And the, the year is then on your x-axis. And the number of cases is represented by that blue bar. And the percentage, so essentially the percentage of cases in the United States that are multidrug resistant uh, is then in that orange line above the, the, um, the bar graph. So this is the latest data as of June from 2012. And you can see that the number of multidrug resistant tuberculosis cases has uh, significantly declined from 1993 to 2011. So right now we're, it looks like we're averaging right around a, a hundred cases annually of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. And the percentage of the number of cases is, is only a little over 1%. So maybe one and a quarter percent of our entire cases is multidrug resistant tuberculosis. So we don't see a, a large number of multidrug resistant tuberculosis cases, but we also don't have zero multidrug resistant tuberculosis cases either. So I think this is important an important thing to consider. I think it, it's also important to think about trends. So we talked about the people who are at greater risk for tuberculosis are those who um, really immigrated from, from somewhere where tuberculosis is more common. And we can use that information in terms of where they came from to help determine the resistance patterns and whether they're, they're more likely to have a multi-drug resistant um, strain of tuberculosis. So our drug susceptibility testing is very important to help guide our therapy. The standard that's typically used is the agar proportion method. Essentially what they do is they grow, they look for the amount of growth on drug-containing media as compared to the growth on drug-free media. And a greater than um, one percent, greater than one percent growth on the drug containing media indicates significant resistance. Certainly, this data takes a while to come back as we've already discussed. Tuberculosis is a mycobacterium tuberculosis is a very slow growing organism, but it, it this is a very important piece in terms of guiding our therapy. Our options for resistant tuberculosis are based on our resistance patterns. So the resistance pattern is in your the left-hand column of the table with the recommended treatment regimen in the right-hand column of the table. So if we have resistance to isoniazid, the recommendation is to use rifampin, pyrazidamide, and ethambutol plus or minus a fluoroquinolone. The duration is typically six months. If we have resistance to rifampin, the recommendation is to initiate isoniazid, ethambutol, a fluoroquinolone, uh, pyrazidamide for 12 to 18 months. If we have resistance to isoniazid and rifampin, this is considered our multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And then we start to get into fluoroquinolone plus pyrazidamide plus ethambutol, 
plus an alternative agent such as streptomycin or amikacin or canamycin. A lot of this is going to be based on our susceptibility testing. And then we're talking about treating from 18 to 24 months, so closer to the two-year mark when we start talking about really multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. This is really where our new med medication potentially comes into play. So this is the first medication approved to treat multidrug resistant tuberculosis in 40 years. The medication is Sertiro or Betaquiline. I did include just some really fast fact information for everybody uh, about the medication. So it is um, a daryl-quinolone antimycobacterial medication, only currently indicated in combination therapy for adults over the age of 18 with pulmonary multidrug resistant tuberculosis. So it's only been studied in pulmonary disease. The dosage is 400 milligrams um, by mouth daily for two weeks and then 200 milligrams three times per week for an additional 22 weeks. It must be used in combination with at least three other medications to which the patient's um, isolate has been shown to be susceptible to in vitro. And if the in vitro testing results are not available, it should be initiated in combination with at least four other drugs to which the patient's tuberculosis is likely susceptible. It is available as a 100 milligram tablet, so when people are taking the 400 milligrams daily, it is four tablets by mouth daily. In terms of the adverse reactions seen with um, betaquiline, the most common included nausea, arthralgias, and headache that were seen in about a third of the patients taking the medications. This medication is not without risk in terms of transaminitis as well. It was seen in about, in about 8% of patients as well as anorexia and rash. I think the big warning that comes with um, betaquiline is the risk for QTC prolongation. So there is a recommendation that EKG should be obtained at baseline and then at least at weeks 2, 12, and 24 after initiating the medication. Because there is the risk for these conduction abnormalities, electrolytes should be monitored at baseline and that really includes potassium, calcium, and magnesium are three big electrolytes that we would be most concerned with conduction abnormalities. And if the QTC um, becomes longer than 500 milliseconds, it's recommended that this medication be discontinued. Uh, in terms of drug-drug interactions, it is metabolized by CYP3A4. Um, so rifampin is a strong inducer, and the AUC of betaquiline is decreased by about half. Contrast to that, ketoconazole is a strong inhibitor and the AUC is increased by about um, a fourth. So it's important to keep in mind that we could have some significant drug-drug interactions with this medication and to potentially think about uh, adjusting dosages uh, as necessary. So in terms of renal and hepatic impairment, there's no dosage adjustment necessary with mild to moderate. We are, they, they are recommending using caution in patients who have severe renal or hepatic impairment. So those are just your quick, fast facts about betaquiline, just so you have uh, just sort of a general understanding of, of some important things to think about with this medication. I included the clinical trial data for you. Um, this is a medication that went through the uh, faster approval through the FDA. So they submitted their new drug application in November of 2012, was approved very quickly. And the, the clinical trials that have currently been completed uh, and allowed for the medication to be FDA approved are only phase two trials. So there's three phase two trials. And um, when I looked for this information in uh, journal form, I, I couldn't actually find it, but you do have access to all this information um, through the FDA's website. So the trials that have been completed are the C202 trial, which was a phase two proof of principle, open label, randomized trial in treatment naive subjects with um, positive sputum smear tuberculosis. They've also completed uh, C208, which was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind multi-center trial in newly diagnosed sputum smear positive pulmonary TB. This was in 47 patients. Stage 2 of this trial, which is currently ongoing, um, was a proof-of-efficacy um, stage that was conducted on 161 patients. This is really where they compared, they, they used um, susceptibility profiles and they, every patient was on a, a background regimen that their TB was uh, susceptible to. Uh, and then in terms of 
additional medications, they were on their background regimen plus betaquiline or their background regimen plus placebo. That's the, the data that I'm going to show you on the next slide. C209 is an ongoing trial. It was an uncontrolled single arm phase 2B trial in 233 newly diagnosed treatment experience multidrug resistant tuberculosis subjects. And then there is a phase three trial that's planned to be initiated in 2013. So I think we're going to be seeing some, some more data uh, in terms of more patients um, in this phase three trial. So really in these trials, what they used as their endpoint was culture conversion. And that's defined as having two consecutive negative cultures from spot sputa collected at least 28 days apart. And then any... Uh, cultures done in between that time period, they would also have to be negative as well. And so on this next slide, this is the data that really is what allowed the FDA to, to approve this medication. So this is the C208 stage 2 data, and it's representative of 161 patients. And they, uh, as I mentioned before, they were comparing a background regimen plus placebo or a background regimen plus um, betaquiline, which is uh, abbreviated TMC207. And so this data is comparing culture conversion in the two treatment arms. So just to orient you to this, um, on the y-axis you have the proportion of culture positive patients and on the y or the x-axis you have the time in weeks. The orange line is the background regimen plus placebo and the blue line is the background regimen plus betaquiline. And really what you can see is that um, culture negativity is achieved much sooner in patients who are on the betaquiline as compared to those who are on the background regimen. So this medication does get people to culture conversion sooner, um, and, and, and so it, it definitely is effective. And because multidrug resistant tuberculosis can be so difficult, I think it's it's a great option to have in our arsenal. Although it's not the kind of medication that, that is going to be the next blockbuster drug in terms of lots of patients on it. But I think it is an, an important step in being able to, to better treat these multidrug resistant patients. Um, as I mentioned, it is the first medication to treat multidrug resistant tuberculosis that's come on the market in 40 years. So that really brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, hopefully you got some, some good information about tuberculosis and you've now been updated on the, the latest um, medication that's been approved for the treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. To, so just to back up and summarize, there are several risk factors that increase the risk for contracting pulmonary tuberculosis. These risk factors really should be considered when we're evaluating patients. The primary tuberculosis infection can progress to either clinical or latent disease. It's important to remember that patients with latent disease are not infectious, but they could have reactivation of the disease. So it is important to go ahead and treat them generally with monotherapy for nine months. We do have guidelines available from the Infectious Disease Society of America. So we'd want to use these when we're making decisions for patients with pulmonary tuberculosis. As I've mentioned, some of the tables uh, are a bit simplified for this presentation, but certainly those guidelines are available for free to everyone. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look at them if you're involved in the treatment of patients who have pulmonary tuberculosis. Then finally, multidrug resistant tuberculosis is rare in the United States, but it continues to be a public health concern and an important area for future research um, because it is so difficult to treat. So thank you everyone for tuning in.